Right, so um, welcome back, everybody. I think we are pretty much exactly five minutes late, so that's a good point to start, I think. Um, our second panel is about competition damage litigation, um, more specifically, which obviously for, I think for most of the people in this room is at the moment only pretty much of a, of a booming industry, so to speak, both, uh, both for the lawyers and for the economists. Um, on our panel, we will discuss um, in particular the role of, uh, sort of economic expert evidence uh, and its role in, uh, in, in competition damages litigation. Uh, and we'll try to discuss and, and maybe answer questions like how should uh, economic evidence be presented uh, in court or in litigation in order to make the case stick both on the claimant uh, and on the defendant side how has economic analysis been used in such cases, uh, maybe in some recent cases, and ha has it been maybe abused in some, uh, in some instances? How is quantitative evidence um, valued when compared to other types of evidence? How do courts go about evaluating evidence? And in particular, how do courts go about uh, weighing up conflicting evidence when, uh, when presented by the two opposing uh, parties to a case? Um, so, in, in, in order to discuss all of these things, we've got a uh, very competent panel uh, up here tonight. Uh, we've got uh, Marie Demetriou, who will be very familiar to all of you, um, one of the uh, leading advocates in the UK on uh, competition law. Um, so, she will cover the, uh, the legal angles of, of all of these topics. Um, and then in the uh, economics, Camp. I'm accompanied by two senior managing directors of the economic and financial consulting practice uh, of uh, FTI. Um, all people up here, I think, have uh, a lot of court experience. They have appeared in courts, have given written and oral evidence uh, in the UK courts, in, in courts in other countries, in arbitration forums, etc., etc. Um, so there, there is a lot of experience gathered here. Um, we're going to play it pretty much uh, like, like the previous panel, so each of us is going to uh, basically use uh, about 10 minutes to give their own perspective on, uh, on the various topics that I mentioned, uh, and after that we'll open the floor uh, to discussion and also give you, uh, of course, um, opportunity to, to make comments or ask questions. Um, okay, so that, those are the preliminaries, in which case I would say Greg Harmon to start. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going to talk about competition damages, not from the perspective of how do you calculate damages following on from a competition finding, but really about the, the types of evidence that are, that are required to support a competition damages case. Uh, my history is that I spend half of my time calculating damages in commercial disputes, largely in international arbitration, and half the time working on competition matters, uh, focusing mainly on competition finance type issues, and I work alongside competition economists uh, in, in the calculation of, of damages, but also in calculating when prices are abusive uh, from an excessive perspective or, or, or if, they're, if they're predatory. Um, uh, and so, you know, I guess what are, what are my thoughts generally in terms of, of, of economic evidence. Um, I think the last panel demonstrated that you know, economic theory is or can be you know, driven by various assumptions and um, different economists can have competing views on what those assumptions might be uh, and it can get pretty complex pretty quickly. Um, but I think that you have, to un, you, know, you have to look at the theory quite carefully to, to work out whether the theory is telling you something that is correct in a particular matter. So for example, um, I was working on the MasterCard Sainsbury's case and when the question of interest came up, it was, it was argued that at the margin, economic theory would tell us that an efficient firm would face a finance cost at the margin equal to its weighted average cost of capital. And of course, that is what economic theory would tell you. And the people who sit behind those models have also done rather well in the economic 
uh, academic uh, community in, in terms of winning Nobel Prizes and the like. So you might sit there and say, that's the economic theory, that must be right. But actually, if you delved into the, into the factual matrix of that case, you found out quite quickly that one of the fundamental assumptions that firms were acting efficiently was violated in that case. Um, and I think we've all just seen that there's you know, lots of debates on, on the interchange cases, but I think we can all you know, agree that, at least on this particular aspect, you know, the judge got it absolutely right that probably interest shouldn't be calculated at the weight average cost of capital. That's not to say that it couldn't be applied in different cases, but it has to depend on, on the facts of the case. And I think this is generally a problem with, with economics, that there are competing theories. And I, and I think that it was President Truman that said, you know, give me a one-handed economist, because you know, on the one hand, my economists tell me this, and on the other hand, they, they tell me something you know, quite different. Uh, but I think that trying to understand the facts of the case might help you to get to an economist that is only one-handed. So bearing that in mind, what, what, what should I say about this? I think you know, the courts are always going to have to make decisions based on the evidence that is put before them. I mean, that is obvious. Uh, and they have to do the best that they can on the basis of, of that information. Um, and, but what I see a lot in cases is that people put forward economic theory, and that's as far as they go. Academic theory tells me this, but they don't support it with anything else. Uh, and I find that if you don't put the positive case forward, if you don't find other evidence to support that theory, then that can lead to some dire consequences. So I worked in a very large case um, in South Africa a couple of years ago, an excessive pricing case between Sasol Chemicals uh, brought by the Commission of South Africa. And uh, the Commission just didn't put a good case forward. So pretty much on every single argument that they raised, we had very many points that said that's, that's just not right. That's not the way that you should frame this test. Uh, the case got appealed up to the Competition Appeals Court, and the judge basically gave the Commission a slap, saying, you cannot run your cases this way. You, you have to support your case. So, yes, you do have to support the case with, with data, uh, not just economic theory evidence, but other evidence that's in the, in, the factual, in the factual matrix. So one thing that I'm finding as a trend, generally, is that accounting data can be used by the judge and relied upon the judge because at least it has an objective beginning to it. It is a information that is produced by, a, by the firm on an annual basis. It's audited. Um, and I, I see cases where quite a lot of weight gets placed on, on, on that type of evidence. Um, again, in that Sasol case, uh, the starting point from, from the economics perspective is that the, the law says that uh, an excessive price is a price that bears no reasonable relation to economic value. And in the case law, um, the, the judgment has been that what does economic value mean? It means it's a, it's a price that you would observe in a competitive market, in a notionally competitive market, which obviously has the economists absolutely salivating because that's exactly what they would think about economic value and how prices are derived. But then, of course, that led to hundreds of different counterfactuals and but-fors about what would that competitive market be. Uh, and I think it was commented that you know we were going into different parallel universes because you know one just didn't know. Um, once it got up to the competition appeal court, the judge effectively said, well, all of that theory is, is helpful to an extent, but I find it difficult to rely upon. And in this particular case, given that we're dealing with a, a, a dominant company, then obviously the monopolist costs have to be relevant. That is the market that we observe. So as a starting point, we are going to take the monopolist costs and we're going to consider that adjusted to economic costs as a basis for determining what economic value would be in this case, bearing in mind that prices might be above that minimal benchmark. But it's interesting that there was this focus on objective information. So following on from that, it's not just about accounting data, but I think it's other forms of data that are vitally important, that once you get into the factual matrix, there's a rich vein of information from budgets, pricing documents, management accounts, 
strategy documents, investor communications. And I think that the role of an expert is to take their economic theory as the starting point, because obviously that tells us how we should frame our analysis. But then you have to look to these other sources of evidence to see if everything is pointing in the same direction. And I think there's a whole wealth of information that can be found in, in that documentation. So what else do I think that expert evidence should do? I mean, I think that whatever you put forward has to have some degree of common sense. It has to make sense. It has to have intuitive appeal. So I was working on a large airline case between uh, British Airways, Comair, and South African Airlines uh, in a follow-on damages case after uh, an infringement in the travel agent market. And effectively, what the other side, South African Airlines, argued was, if we look at the market share of this company over time, we observed that it fell. And you say that it was because of this infringement, um, but we don't believe that is the case. And if we look at the ex post period, that's as soon as the infringement stopped, we don't see any bounce back in demand. There is no bounce back, and we conclude from that that this infringing scheme had no effect at all. Otherwise, it would have bounced back. So I raised you know, the rather obvious point is that airlines have frequent flyer programs. And if you capture a client and you a customer and they get onto your frequent flying program, there's going to be a bit of stickiness in the marketplace. There's going to be a lingering effect in the marketplace. They argued absolutely not. So, you know, there was a bit of back and forth um, on this in cross-examination. And then the judge leant forward and went, oh, are we talking about frequent flyer programs? Well, I have one of those. I'm on South African Airlines and I would never fly BA Comair because of it. <laughs> Right, and you knew at that moment, you know, you're on, you're on for a bit of a winner when the judge is siding on with you. Um, but then, I mean, this, this is a good case, I think, of, of what not to do in, in expert evidence. The, the next, I think, trap that my, um, my fellow expert on the other side fell into was, was trying to hoodwink with spurious relationships by looking at correlations and suggesting that there was some causality between them. You know, so what do I mean by that? Well, you know, there is a statistical correlation between eating ice creams and the number of deaths by drowning in the summer. Well, yes, there is, but the missing variable there is, is the fact that it's summer, and in the summer lots of people are eating ice creams and swimming in rivers. Uh, and it came up in this case again. The issue here was is that during the infringement, uh, and we could see that demand was falling for BA Comair, they... Comair also launched a low-cost carrier. And so economists on the other side went, ha-ha, your fall in market share was because of this low-cost carrier. Uh, it obviously cannibalized your, your demand, and now you're trying to, to claim damages from us. But it was a spurious correlation, because if you looked at the data carefully, you saw before the entry of the low-cost carrier, demand was falling. And that actually, when the infringement stopped, <coughs> the low-cost carrier was having no effect on BA Comair's market share. So, and there was a whole other host of other information and evidence to suggest that that wasn't the case. But the expert was just completely blind to this and had just tried to palm off some simple correlation. And it can be rather fatal to the case, as it was in this case, that, um, that none of their information was, was relied upon. Um, uh, you know, for me, I'm guided by CPR, you know, 35, and, and most experts should take that very, very seriously. Um, and one of the points that, you know, I often reflect on is, 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 is telling the whole story and not trying to only tell half the story. And so you often see that people are selective in the evidence that they give, kind of selectively looking at information to confirm the evidence that they want to put forward, so-called confirmation bias. But I generally think that that is... I think that's fatal to your case because if somebody points to an article and says, look, it says this, do you think I'm not going to read that and read the next two paragraphs down and say, but it says something completely different below that? You know, why haven't you said the, the full picture? So uh, you see that a lot. And, and I don't know whether it's because uh, in the competition damages space, it's a newer thing than in the commercial damages space. I don't know. So maybe some people are still learning their trade. Don't know, but, but see it a lot. I think the last thing that I would say in terms of, you know, what does a well-prepared damages case looks like, you, you've, got to, you've got to sense check the outputs. 
uh, pretty much in any claim of this type, you see the classic hockey stick kind of graph where it says, you know, but for the infringement, my sales would have gone absolutely through the roof. You know, once you start to look at those trends, you can say, well, how is it that you could grow at 20% forever, but for this infringement? And you could have had margins of 50% that when prior to the, uh, the infringement, you had margins of, of 10%. So the, mo the more that you can do to sense check, even if it's only a simple sense check, I think that you're giving the judge or the tribunal more things to say, well, that looks reasonable because all of these other pieces of, of evidence align. Um, we were meant to talk a little bit about deceptions in, in written evidence. Um, I think in economics it's difficult because you know, some of it is about belief. You know, economists can have different thoughts because they believe different things. They could be an antitrust hawk versus an antitrust dove. But the question for me is, is at what point does that belief you know, become a deception? And I think for the honest and competent expert, that that shouldn't happen. Um, since an expert that values their career you know, wouldn't fall into this trap. Um, you know, I, I'm always still taken by, by what Justice Laddie said you know, 20 odd years ago when effectively said, you know, the judge is not a rustic who has chosen to play a game of three card trick. He is not fair game and nor is the truth. And, and I think that does apply um, in everything that we do. But I think there's two kind of questions that we, you know, we may come back to. And that is, the one is the framing of the question and it came up in the last panel to say that the experts had been instructed to answer a particular question. And, and I think there is a valid point there as to you know, what role an expert has in, in following that instruction. I've certainly seen many cases where somebody's been asked, well, you've been told to value these damages using the fair market value principle, but did you think that was right? Should you have used the fair value principle? And you would have got a different result uh, so the expert says, yeah, but that's not what I was instructed. Mm, the court can then turn around to you, but, but I might have found that helpful if you had said something about it. So, that, so that's a difficult area for, for experts. Uh, and I think the, the last area is when an expert starts to put a boundary around what his expertise is. Um, and, and you may often think the question, why have they done that? Are they trying to hide something? that they don't like. So I've been on another case where there was, an, uh, there was an accountant and an economist. And the economist was suggesting that they had no knowledge of the cost of capital, which I find very difficult because it's covered in every master's uh, topic on, on, on economics. Uh, we'll rely on the accountant for that. But the accountant's position was so far-fetched, it wasn't believable. And so when the economist was asked, what do you think about this? And said, well, that's not my area of expertise. It lacked a whole level of credibility and it was something that the judge picked up on ultimately and, and found against them on, on that fact, both of them. So anyway, that's all I have to say on that. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, so next up is uh, Meloria Meski, so already mentioned, uh, another senior managing director of uh, FTI's economics and financial consulting practice. Good evening. Uh, I am going to uh, follow a very tough act to follow. Uh, I'm actually an economist and a statistician. And I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to explain how do we go about uh, essentially passing from the assumptions that underpin uh, economic theory to assessing what is actually that the data are telling us, so which assumptions are right. The issue here is that markets are very complex. I mean, the economy is a complex thing. And developing a theory of how markets work requires a lot of assumptions, because you need to make it simple in order to be able to model it using mathematics, which is what economists do, essentially. So, once you start with the assumptions, different assumptions lead you to different theories, and these theories are often comp competing. So the thing is, how do you choose between theories? So what, how do you say this is right and this is wrong? And the, question, the answer of this is that there is nothing right and nothing wrong, because this is not what you believe. It shouldn't be what you believe. It should be what the reality is. So you use data 
to test and to see which theory actually better, is better informed by the data. This is nothing new, actually. Uh, human knowledge has progressed since, well, time immemorial, I like this expression, uh, by formulating theories about anything, really, and then testing these theories. If you're a scientist, it's easier. You know, if there is vacuum and you drop something, it falls always at the same speed. Well, for economics, it's different because it's a social science, and so people respond to incentives and different things happen. But if, what happens if suitable data is not available? Because this is one of the situations where we often find ourselves. You can test theories if you have data. If you don't have data, how do you go about finding the truth, essentially? Uh, this is then, this becomes a matter of how credible the assumptions that underlie your theory are. So I have an example uh, in my experience of um, a pass-through analysis in a damages case follow following the cartel. And this was um, a case on a, it was a fundamental ingredient essentially that goes into animal feed. And when I say fundamental, is you know, if chicken don't take this ingredient, they don't, they can't even stand up. So it's something that has to go into animal feed. This, uh, like many cartel cases, this never went to court. But in this, with this particular um, defendant, the defendant didn't want to settle and went into mediation. So what happened in mediation? Of course, you have a cartel. You need to uh, assess what the overcharge is. And it doesn't really matter if the overcharge is 10%, 20%, 30%, if then the overcharge can be passed through wholesale into the next stage, right? So the, the fight at that point was whether there was pass-through or there wasn't any pass-through. The thing is, if, if you are in a situation like that, all the data is actually with the claimant. As a defendant, you don't have the data to test whether the claimant could pass through the overcharge or not. And because this was a fundamental ingredient, but it was, in, in a way, the incidence of this ingredient into the final cost of feed was so small that you could argue that you know, it's so small you pass it through. But by the same token, you can say it's so small that you, know, you don't even bother passing it, through, passing it through because you have to change contracts and so on and so forth. At the end, what solved the problem was the snapshot of a page of the website of the claimant where the claimant actually claimed, well, boasted, this was the investor relations part of the website, that they were price makers and that they were able to maintain margins and profitability in the face of increases in costs. And so at that point, uh, the mediation was very successful for the defendant. And this, uh, essentially, this confirms what Greg was saying, that you need to look at all the facts of the case. You can't just obsess with, you know, I'm an economist, I'm, well, I'm even worse than an economist because I'm a statistician. And, you know, I need the data, I need to test this, I need to have, you know, like rocket science models. No, you just take a picture of the website and you win the case. So what happens uh, when you actually have data? Uh, well, when you have data, you can actually do what really makes me happy. So you can estimate the pass-through. And this is uh, a different case. And actually here, you know, as you say, sometimes you have a hypothesis that is so precise that you can't get it wrong, essentially. So in this particular case, um, we were dealing with a petrochemical product. And as a petrochemical product, it's a little bit like, you know, baking something. There is so much input into so much output. And in this particular case, it took 1.3 units of a certain input to produce one unit of the output. 
So the, the, the test was, the hypothesis was very simple. So for, if you have a $1 change in the input price, you can expect a 1.3 change in the output price, uh, you know, if you have um, a, a pass-through, full pass-through. And of course there can be temporary changes in demand, uh, or there can be sudden changes in input prices, and the equilibrium relationship between the two gets changed. And so how does, uh, how do you test this? Uh, the idea was that economic theory would say that disruption wouldn't last long. So in the long term, you end up having the same kind of relationship. You know, one dollar of input, 1.3 for the output. And the, the, the thing here is, you know, in the long run, the Keynes once said that in the long run we're all dead. Or trying to figure out what the long run is is like assessing how long is a piece of string and all these kind of, you know, things. But actually, if you have an econo a model that test this, it is possible to measure it. And so we had two questions. The first question was, when the price of the input changes by one dollar, by how much um, does the output price change? And the second question was, how long does it take for this change to take effect? Because in, in, in the petrochemical industry, a lot of what is bought and sold is based on contracts. So to change price on contracts takes a little bit of time because it, it's, there are clauses to the contracts, there are negotiations that have to take place. And another question is, does the is the change symmetric? So if the price goes up by $1, does the price change by 1.3? But what does it what happens and how long does it take if the price goes down? So does the, can the company actually retain the profit from an input price fall? And so if you look at that picture, what we got from the model, and sometimes statistics works actually, was that every time there was an increase in price by $1, the um, increase of the output price was $1.3, which is exactly what we expected. And it would take three months, approximately, for this to go through into the final price. And then there will be equilibrium again. Uh, so this is all I had to say, really. Uh, in some cases, you don't have data. But when you have data, and especially in cases where you deal with cartels, very often, cartels uh, are, um, well, they are centered on raw materials or essential ingredients or, that have a very short, very small impact on the final price, and that's why they are successful. Uh, in, that, in those particular cases, it's, it's much easier because they are not complex cases, such as the trucks, for example, um, to estimate overcharges and also to estimate pass-through. Thanks very much. Um, so we'll, we'll have one more economics lecture before the, mm -hmm. uh, before the legal expertise kicks in. Um, I'd just like to spend a few minutes to talk about um, well, actually a hobby horse of mine, uh, which is uh, the relevance of the concept of statistical significance uh, in the context of estimating cartel damages. Uh, and, and the reason this occurred to me now is just in a, in, in a very recent case, I came across um, roughly the statement you have on the slide there uh, in, in, a, in, in an expert report that was uh, presented by defendants in a cartel damages uh, case. And essentially what the, what the expert had done, he had um, done some econometric analysis of the sort that uh, Melorias just described. He found um, that there was an overcharge of 3% compared to the cartel price. And then, however, he went on to argue uh, that um, this price increase was statistically insignificant uh, and as a consequence of that, 
it did not constitute evidence that there had been any damage uh, and used that argument in support, to support an argument that um, actually the damage was zero and, and, and the, sh the case should be closed. Um, and this argument, which you might call the uh, statistical significance uh, defense, you actually encounter it quite often. Um, and, and as far as I know, it is, it, it, it's not really settled whether, whether it's actually a valid argument. I think it, it, it merits some discussions, and I hope people in the, in the room will have views on that. I certainly do. Um, but before, before I present those to you, I'd just like to give you a, a first quick idea uh, of what exactly uh, this thing actually is, statistical, statistical significance. Um, and for that purpose, I've, I've made up a little uh, e e example to illustrate, uh, to illustrate things. Mm -hmm. So what you have here uh, in this example is essentially uh, the evolution of the prices of a cartelized product during part of the cartel period and then also afterwards. Uh, and if you just assume for simplicity that in the whole period for which we have data here in, the, uh, in this chart, uh, there have not been any significant changes in demand or cost conditions or anything like that. So that really the, the, the end of the cartel, there where, where, the, where the dotted black line is, is, is the only thing uh, that made any difference to pricing dynamics in the period of observation. Um, if you can assume that that's right, and let's just do for simplicity that it is right, then uh, the uh, price that you observe after the cartel end that should be a good benchmark for the counterfactual price, i.e. the price that you would have observed during the cartel period if there had not been, uh, if there had not been any um, cartel. Uh, and so basically you can do what all economists call a during and after comparison, so you just compare prices during the cartel with prices after the cartel, and the difference gives you an estimate of the, uh, of the overcharge. So that's what you have here. Now, there's one, uh, one additional issue to consider, though, which is that uh, in this chart, you see quite a, a strong fluctuation of prices around the, uh, around the period averages. Um, right, so you, you see them go up and down. Um, and what that means is that it will create some uncertainty as to how accurately uh, sort of these averages actually measure the cartelized price level uh, and the counterfactual price level. The way of thinking about this is um, if you just assume you have done this analysis and suddenly uh, out of a cupboard comes more data. So you find a, bit, a little bit of additional data, which is, of, which is on the next slide. Uh, which allows you to look at a longer time series. So basically you recalculate and suddenly you find that uh, with more data, uh, suddenly the cartel price on average looks a little bit lower and the uh, counterfactual price looks a little bit higher and as a consequence, you suddenly estimate a very much smaller uh, overcharge. And of course, that, that, that casts some doubt on the, uh, on the reliability of the overcharge itself. And I mean, you, can, you can think this further, uh, and you can easily imagine uh, examples that are very plausible where you get even more data, all of the prices which sort of fall roughly in the, in the ranges that you find here and that they are therefore plausible, uh, where the overcharge gets smaller and smaller and ends up being zero. So in the end, what you have here is you have a situation where you measured an overcharge, but you know that there is some probability um, that you overestimated it and that the actual overcharge is, uh, that the actual overcharge is zero. So basically you're committing a type one error, you're finding a problem where actually there isn't one. So how do econometricians deal with that problem? Um, essentially by statistical testing. Um, so there are statistical tools to assess this. Uh, essentially having produced a point estimate of what the, uh, of what the overcharge uh, might have been, you can then use the same data to do an additional test, which is the significance test, basically. So essentially, you, you ask the data, um, what is the likelihood of observing an estimate as high as the one you, that you found, or even higher than that, under the hypothetical assumption that actually there is no problem? So you, you, you assume, the count, you, you assume uh, that it is true that there wasn't actually an overcharge, and ask how likely is it that I will observe something as extreme as I have observed. And then essentially the, the, the test consists of uh, estimating what that likelihood is, how high is it, and then uh, 
judging whether I think there's a very high likelihood or there's a very low likelihood of, of that type 1 error occurring. If the type 1 error occurs, is found to occur with a sufficiently low probability, below some previously uh, established threshold, then we say uh, we, can, we can reject the uh, assumption that the uh, actual overcharge is zero and we accept that there was an overcharge and we accept the point estimate. If the uh, likelihood that you get a type 1 error is very high, then you are not able to uh, reject the hypothesis that there wasn't an overcharge. Uh, um, so you cannot reject it, and therefore you don't trust uh, your own point estimate. And that's the whole d discussion about significance uh, levels. How, how likely is it, given the data that I, given the point estimate that I have, given the fluctuation that I see around the uh, point estimate, how likely is it that, the, that, that it might still be the case that really nothing has happened? And that's essentially the argument. That's what you often see in, uh, in defendant uh, expert reports. They find an insignificant result, and therefore they say there's no evidence uh, we should be acquitted. And basically, that's the question. Do we accept, uh, do we accept that argument? Uh, the, the issue is certainly controversial. It would be very interesting to hear your opinions about that, including on whether these things, uh, how intensely these things uh, get discussed, especially in the English course, where I'm not doing all that much work. Um, but my personal view is that, especially in the, uh, in the context of estimating cartel damages, especially in, if it's a follow-on case, uh, then the question of whether the result that you're finding uh, is statistically significant or not should really be uh, second order. And the main reason I think, uh, I think that that's the case is basically that, especially uh, now that uh, in, in most cases the damages directive has been uh, has been uh, implemented. Uh, implemented. Uh, it, it is very hard to uh, sort of marry the uh, the argument of the uh, statistical significance defense with the presumption that cartels cause harm. Right, so essentially we, ha we have a situation where uh, sort so of the whole case starts with the presumption that uh, price-fixing cartels, etc., cause harm. Uh, in a situation like that, if you have produced uh, a, an econo econometric analysis that is technically sound, that relies on the best data that you have had available, that doesn't make any dodgy assumptions, uh, and you get a point estimate, and that's really a, arguably the best point estimate that, that, that is available, um, then the fact that there is some uncertainty around it uh, and there is some likelihood that you, that you have overestimated something uh, should not be sufficient uh, to rebut the, uh, the, the presumption that actually the cartel will, ha will have caused an, uh, some degree of harm. Uh, and it would be appropriate to go with the, uh, with the point estimate even, even if it's not statistically significant. I mean, you, you can think this a little bit further if you think in terms of the of the things that determine whether you're going to find a, a significant result or not, um, th then it may become uh, even clearer. So ba basically the three drivers of uh, significant versus non-significant uh, is, first of all, do you find a large overcharge or a small overcharge? So clearly the, the closer you get to zero with your estimate, the more likely it is that you will get uh, a, an insignificant result. But that would be unfair because essentially it shouldn't depend on whether somebody suffered a small or a large overcharge, uh, whether, whether in the end it gets quashed completely or he, or he actually gets something. So I, I think that, that that would be a problem in and of itself. Um, another thing that, uh, that determines um, whether or not you get a precise result, a significant result, is, is uh, the number of data points that you have available for your uh, analysis. And again, I think it would not be correct uh, that, um, that, that claimants uh, should uh, essentially bear the cost of the fact that more data was not available, especially if the, if the absence or, or presence of a lot of data doesn't really mean that uh, the, the, the result is biased in, in, in one way or the other automatically. Um, so that would be the position. It would be interesting afterwards to hear what, what people think about that. And with that, I'd Thank Pass you. on to Marie.
So I think um, most people here will have had direct experience of how challenging and tricky it can be for judges to determine questions of economics. And um, Neil Dryden's discussion on interchange provides a perfect illustration of that. Um, and I want to look at um, cartel damages claims um, and uh, how courts go about determining economic questions in those cases. And um, one of the interesting things about cartel damages claims, I think, most of them tend to be follow-on claims, is that um, very often the three biggest issues in those cases are what is the overcharge, is there an overcharge, um, and if so, what was it, um, and was there pass-on, and if so, to what extent, and compound interest. And those three questions are usually the biggest questions in these cases, and they're all questions which turn um, to a large extent on economic evidence. Um, but there's only been, I think, one cartel damages case which has actually fought all the way through, which is the recent Britned against ABB case, which was heard in February um, before Mr. Justice Marcus Smith and on which we're awaiting judgment. So there's not terribly much guidance about how courts go about determining these e economic questions. And I wanted to look in particular at overcharge, because that's the sort of starting point and usually the big question in these cases. And typically what will happen, and this was the case in, Britned, uh, in the Britned case, is that you'll have um, a, an expert report from an economist on the claimant side saying that the overcharge is, I think in Britain they said it was 25% or something, so in the low, in the low 20s. And then there'll be one or more um, reports, usually econometric reports on each side, um, on the defendant side, or maybe multiple if there are multiple defendants, saying that the overcharge is zero or close to zero. And um, that's, uh, the, the question really is how does the court go about deciding what the overcharge was faced with these seemingly well put together and quite complicated um, econometric reports saying very different things. And uh, of course what the court has got to do and what it will do is test the economic evidence and traditionally that's done through cross-examination and increasingly in competition cases it's being done through a hot tub and that's something I'll come back to at the end. Um, but um, the court's got to take a view on the strengths and weaknesses of the competing expert reports. But the factual evidence in the case is also extremely important and I think it's, it's useful to to distinguish two categories of factual evidence. So the first is factual evidence, which is essentially the data um, which is input into the economic models, um, which form the basis for the expert reports. Um, but the second category is, is evidence which is not data evidence, but which is wider factual evidence in the case. So wider factual evidence about the operation of the cartel and the market in which the cartel operated. And this might include, for example, contemporaneous documents um, from the cartelists about the mechanics of the cartel arrangements or the expectations of the cartel participants about how effective the cartel was going to be. And I want to focus on that second category of evidence because um, sometimes I think economic reports um, don't sort of place as much weight on that wider evidence as they might. And I think that that wider evidence is very relevant and very important. Um, why, why do I think that? Because the court has got to decide ultimately what happened. And it won't want to take a decision, the court won't want to take a decision that is divorced from reality or from the facts of the case. And let's say, for example, that one of the experts is saying, as in, um, as in Tilo's slide, that the overcharge is zero or very close to zero. Well, I think that, that most judges are likely to start from a position where they think, well, that doesn't sound very plausible because why did these companies, sophisticated companies, enter into these cartel arrangements and adhere to them for a number of years if actually it had no effect? Why were they doing that? They're all sophisticated companies and there must have been some purpose to all of this. And so 
if the defendant is going to persuade the judge that the overcharge is zero, I think it's not enough to have a very well put together economic model, an expert report, but they're going to have to point to evidence in the case which helps persuade the judge that this is a plausible result. And the court, uh, another reason why I think that this sort of extraneous, um, wider evidence is very important is that where the judge is faced with competing expert analyses, it's very rare that the judge is going to think, well, actually, I think this one is absolutely excellent and the other one is terrible, so I'm going completely for the first one. In fact, what's likely to happen is after the process of cross-examination or hot-tubbing or how, however the evidence is tested, the judge is much, much more likely to think, well, there are some strengths in the first report, but also some weaknesses, and some strengths in the second report, but also some weaknesses. And so the judge might think, well, I'm going to give 60% weight to the first report and 40% weight to the competing report and come somewhere down the middle. And I think that in deciding that, in deciding where to split the difference, um, the, the extraneous evidence about what actually happened in the cartel is going to be a very important thing. Now, interestingly, in the Britned trial, and we d I wasn't involved in it, but, 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 but from having spoken to the parties that were, um, one possibility that was canvassed by the judge early on in the trial, who was conscious, I think, that he may find some things to like in one report and, and yet other things to like in the other report, was, was well, how do I go about... Um, how, do I go, how, how do I go about determining this? Is there, some, is there some scope for a sort of pick and mix approach to the expert reports? And so one of the things that the judge was canvassing was... Um, perhaps we could have an ongoing dialogue, the court could have an ongoing dialogue with the experts, um, which should be capable of agreement, um, so, so, so as to modify the models with things that he liked from each of the models. Now, I think that maybe that's possible in some cases where the models are similar, but in other cases that may be totally impossible. But I think that's an interesting development in that case. I don't know what, what the judge will do, but it's something to bear in mind, I think, for future cases. And it's illustrative of the judge's difficulty when faced with, um, with, with two... Um, seemingly robust expert reports about how do I go about deciding this and, and actually making a decision on the facts. Now, um, th I think that, that, that all of this is supported. Now, there haven't, been, um, there haven't been cases yet, but this is supported by the comments of Mr. Justice Green in the Peugeot case, the automotive bearings case, which was due to fight in, in May but settled... Um, shortly before the trial was about to start. But there were two quite illuminating judgments given by Mr Justice Green on disclosure applications. And the first ruling that he made on disclosure concerned an application made by the defendants for material in the claimant's possession relating to the process by which the claimant procured automotive bearings. And the claimants resisted disclosure on the basis that this was totally irrelevant to the expert analysis. They said this is just irrelevant material. But the judge rejected that argument, and he said that it wasn't possible at that early stage to decide whether the material was, going to, was definitely going to be relevant. But he said that he could certainly say that it was potentially going to be relevant. And he said that that was for two reasons. The first reason was that the material would reveal whether or not the procurement exercises involved bids from suppliers outside the cartel. And he said that that could shed light on the extent to which the cartel was successful. Um, and secondly, he said it was potentially relevant to the question whether the purchasers had countervailing buyer power. So you can see where the judge is going with this. He's thinking that all of these extraneous facts are going to be relevant to how I approach the economic reports. And then the second, um, so he therefore ordered disclosure, albeit on a, on a sort of stage basis. Um, but the second application was a an application this time made by the claimant, so the boot was on the other foot, and it was the defendant saying this is totally irrelevant. Um, and the, the claimant sought specific disclosure of patent agreements and, and on the basis that the patent agreements were a device used by the cartelists um, by which they enforced particular customer allocations within the, the cartel. Um, and this time, of course, the defendants 
uh, resisted disclosure. But again, Mr. Justice Green ordered the disclosure, and he said this. He said that in any quantum case, it must surely be an elementary starting point that the court or tribunal has a full and comprehensive understanding of the detailed workings of the cartel in question. And he said it's obvious, it's obvious, he said, that a full understanding of the modus operandi of a cartel may be directly relevant to the issues which arise in a quantum case. It doesn't take much imagination to see that this must be the case. Standing back, it's a proper prima facie inference for any court or tribunal to make that the workings of a price-fixing cartel have one aim in mind, viz. the maintenance of supra-competitive prices. It follows that the day-to-day -day workings of the cartel are designed to achieve that end. As such, there is more or less an inevitable nexus between the workings of the cartel and the overcharge that purchasers subsequently may seek to recover. And the judge went on to explain that the positions of the experts were starkly contrasting. So in that case, the claimant's expert said that the overcharge was 10 to 12 percent, and the defendant's expert said no overcharge at all. And the judge said in terms, well, when, I, when I'm faced with deciding what the overcharge is, I'm going to need to take a qualitative view as well, because that's going to help me decide. Um, is going to help me decide where, where the overcharge is. So it's not just a question of testing the economic evidence. I'm going to need, at the, need to look at the qualitative factual evidence. And so where does this, um, what does this mean for, for preparing a cartel damages case? Well, I think, in my view, it means um, probably at least two things. The first is that I think it's very important that the expert report engages with the wider factual evidence. And this is a point that, that Greg was making. Um, because I think that the expert ought usually, in addition to, um, to the modeling, um, tackle the economic question, for example, of whether the features of the particular market mean that collusion could be expected to be successful or not. And so, for example, was there, was there price transparency? Did the cartel cover the whole market, or were there significant market participants that were outside the cartel? Did the purchasers have buyer power? Were there substitute products outside the cartel? All of these are points, I think, on which the expert should be asked to opine. Um, and then secondly, I think it means that evidence from factual witnesses and contemporaneous documents is going to be really, really important. So, for example, how detailed were the, were the cartel arrangements? Were the terms very clear and specific, or were they looser? Could the t cartel be easily monitored? Was there cheating or, or, or some sort of absence of enforcement? I think all of those types of evidence are going to be really influential in um, persuading a judge in relation to the likely overcharge. Um, so that's, I just wanted to say, uh, make a couple of remarks about hot tubbing, which I said I'd come back to, because I've been talking about um, the, the substantive issues, um, but there's also a procedural question as to how economic questions are best assessed. And there does seem to be a growing trend by the courts in competition cases to have hot tubs rather than just cross-examination. And when I acted for the CMA last year in the pay for delay trial in the CAT, which took place over five weeks, there were two different hot tubs of the economists. And, um, and it would be interesting to hear people's views on how that works. My perspective was that um, it has pros and cons. So from, from the, the lawyer's perspective, it's, uh, it sort of depends on how good your expert is and how well they perform. But it, 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 you lose control. So when you cross-examine, you can prepare your cross-examination and, and you, you basically retain or you like to think you retain control over the process. Whereas that goes when there's a hot tub, even if you're allowed to ask follow-up questions by way of cross-examination, because it's all really in the court or tribunal's hands. So I would say from, from, from a traditional sort of advocacy perspective, it has, um, it, it, it's quite challenging. Um, but um, it, it's also, one thing I noticed is that the expert reports in that case were sort of, were saying very different things. And then there was the expert meeting, which sort of narrowed the, the issues considerably. And then suddenly, when the experts were in the hot tub, it was like they were on the same side, because the, the, um, the court was asking, and they were all agreeing with each other on lots of stuff, which was not apparent from their reports at all. 
And so actually, in terms of getting to um, en enabling direct dialogue between the experts, it was successful um, from, from that point of view. So that was just something I wanted to throw open in terms of process. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Those were the lectures. So um, any questions from the audience? Hi, I um, just have one question regarding um, the Competition Appeal, Appeal Tribunal obviously has the panel members and um, often an economist sitting as one of those members and obviously in the Persia case we didn't get a chance to see that in practice but be interested to know the panel's view on how useful um, the presence of an economist on the judicial panel might be uh, in terms of splitting the difference or trying to, to find a halfway house between two very different expert reports. Well, I can go first. Um, I think uh, yes and no. Um, I think sometimes you know the cases can become so complex that it's obvious, obviously helpful for, for a judge to have some some advice. Uh, I've, I've kind of made the same observation in, in commercial litigation and in, in arbitration as to whether uh, this would be of assistance. I think I'd go back to my other point though is that. I do think that you can get different camps of economists as to you know what their views are, and and obviously selecting the right economist for the panel who's neutral is not without its difficulties. And I can imagine you know, potentially both sides complaining that they thought that the economist that had been appointed is unlikely to share their views for whatever reason. But I think on the whole, I, I think it must be helpful. Is my view. I think it definitely helps with hot tubbing because the thing about hot tubbing is you've got to have a judge who's really on top of the economics because so it requires a lot more work from the court and it's completely counter to the way that, that, that litigation has traditionally worked in this country which is, you know, going back now a few years, the court would do, the judge would do very little preparation and come in and hear the competing arguments and this actually requires a lot of preparation and also quite a lot of, of, of understanding of economics um, from the judge because they've got to prepare the questions and explore the issues directly without the help initially of the advocates. And so I think having an economist on the panel potentially can really help with that. I, I think especially when you have very technical presentations, it would be very helpful because there are certain things that are actually objective. So how do you, you know, how do you assess an econometric model? There are certain assumptions that have to be met. Have, has this report, you know, met the assumption? Has this model done what it says on the team, essentially? And a judge is a lawyer, and you know, they they cannot be expected to know, uh, you know, what underpins these models. So I think in that respect, when the case becomes complex. It, it can be very helpful. Yeah, I would agree with that. I th but I think, uh, as we I think all agree, it's it's important that it. I mean, you can define right economists, wrong economists. Mm -hmm. I think I think it, it it has to be an economist with the right with the right expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs to be. If it's a competition case, it has to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially, uh, an economist that has experience in antitrust cases and, and uh, assessing anti antitrust issues, and to the extent that there is going to be econometric analysis involved, it needs to be a person that is certainly a able to understand what's what's being done. Uh, and depending on on the academic background uh, of the of the person on the panel or the professional background, that may not may or may not be the case. And if it's not the case, it, it may well backfire. I mean, I, I, I don't want to mention any names, but I've, I've, I've had uh, cases where, including in the cut, where economists were sitting on the panel and uh, it, it was not really helpful. Mm. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, hot tubbing. Um, so various of the panel members earlier have, have talked about how it's useful to combine uh, both uh, some of the economic and econometric evidence uh, alongside some of the factual evidence and, and uh, in the industry evidence in coming to an overall view. Um, in that light, do you think it might be helpful to have uh, some mixed hot tubs with both economic experts and factual experts? 
So um, taking the example earlier about the interchange fee regulation, uh, I think in some of the the, um, uh, the the judges' findings, they mentioned that none of, none of the experts presented were um, industry experts. Um, do you think it might have been helpful, for example, to have um, an economist giving views alongside someone who might be able to talk from an in industry perspective, whether or not, um, in their view, that might be might oh, some of their um, opinions might uh, make sense? I mean. Um I guess the way it generally works is that the judge is the arbiter of the facts and and so we tend not to have sort of factual experts as such because the judge decides the facts. However, um, I think you make a good point because the cat has scope for, so you have the chair who's a lawyer and then you have um, the economist member and I'm not sure what the rules are but I, I think I mean generally speaking the third member has tended to be another lawyer um, but I'm not sure that that that's necessary and it may well be that in a suitable case it would be useful to have someone with industry specific industry experience and you find for example in employment tribunals that's the case. So you normally have, in an employment tribunal, you have the legal chair and then you have someone from a, 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 an employer's association or with industry expertise from the employer's perspective and then equally somebody from uh, an employee perspective, usually. That's usually how it works. And so I think that might be, I mean, there, there could be scope for that in the CAT and it might be useful depending on the case, particularly if the issue is very arcane factually. But generally, judges tend to be pretty good at deciding factual disputes, I think. I, mean, I have a question to, um, to Greg. I mean, you, you, you talked about uh, one of the root causes of some, sometimes economic evidence being presented that's not well married up with the facts so that in the end ends up not being effective because uh, it, it doesn't seem to address the right question mm. or that divergences appear because different people get to answer different questions and um, experts refuse to answer certain questions because they don't affect or that they're, they're not that relevant to the question that they were instructed to answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what's your experience there? Uh, the questions of instruction, who drafts them? Is it, is it the lawyers? Do you get an influence? Uh, do you propose them and they get discussed? Uh, what's the process at, at, at arriving, sort of the framework of what you're, what you're actually supposed to, uh, to analyze? Gosh, that's a tricky question. Uh, yeah, it's always the lawyers who, um, who obviously instruct you. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, I think things become apparent in cases, you know, potentially quite quickly <laughs> that, um, Especially when you're in the world of counterfactuals, you know, some counterfactuals may turn out to be better for you than, than other counterfactuals, and, and that may come out very early in, 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 in discussions. Um, I think clearly the counterfactual that is put forward has, you know, has to be legally driven because it has to fit with the legal case and with, with the factual case as well, and obviously many of the factual points are outside of the experts. Uh, domain of, of, of expertise, but I still think that on you know at the margin, you know there are there are some things where you think as as an expert that could have been done differently. Uh, it, you know, that's just what happens on on mm -hmm. cases, and you can have a discussion with your lawyers, and uh, and you can be overruled, and I think that puts you in a, in a in a difficult position. You know, thankfully it hasn't happened to me that there's been a fundamental dif disagreement. Um, usually these disagreements come out between the two experts, so at least perhaps through the joint statement some of these things get aired and you start to get some kind of communication about what the issue is. If you're in a, in a hot tub, then this can come out even more and it can be discussed and it can be... Um, but as I said, you know, my, um, you know, my kind of example during my speech is if you're doing a damages case, if it was like a shareholder dispute type of case, you, know, you, have, to, you have to determine what the, the valuation standard is 
Uh, and as I said, there, there are these different standards. There's fair market value, market value, fair value, and all sorts of other combinations in between. And each of them have slightly different rules of how they are applied, depending uh, where you are in the world. And, um, and that can give rise to when you calculate value and you're calculating a pro rata share as to whether you make discounts for things like minority control or for liquidity issues. And, and obviously, I think if you're on the claimant side, you, you don't want to have to discount for, for these factors. And, and, and the lawyers will be you know, very sharp to that. So they'll say, I think you should go with fair, you know, the fair value standard because the fair value standard goes away from the Now, as an expert, you know exactly what's being instructed of you. Um, and so I think it then comes back to this difficult question as to is it just simply a matter of instruction or is there anything that you can add as an expert that might assist the court? And sometimes it, you might be able to say something that might assist the court. So if you are in a, a situation where you are under a fair market value is being argued, you might say the nature of this dispute is such that you are compelling the shareholder to actually sell their shares into potentially an illiquid market when actually in the counterfactual scenario they wouldn't have sold the shares, they would have just maintained ownership and therefore there should be no discount. So as an expert sometimes you can add some value to that and you can put that in your report and say well even if I was instructed on, on the other value I don't think it would have much uh, importance to my calculation for these reasons. But I think it is, it is a difficult thing and, and I've often seen experts cross-examined by saying, why didn't you look at that? And it just leaves, <laughs> just leaves you in a bit of a you know, yeah. tiz really as to how you answer it. I was instructed, <laughs> but <clears throat> difficult. Okay. John. Um, There's a question for you, Tilo. Um, about this point about statistical significance. Yep. Um, so, so I understand, I think, your point that if you have a, an answer which is positive but statistically insignificant from zero, um, you should not say, well, it might be zero because there is a presumption of cartel harm. Clearly, in the sort of opposite situation in which you were in a criminal case where there is a presumption of innocence, then that argument wouldn't apply, and one would say, well, there is, a, there is a real chance here that actually the answer is zero, and therefore my client is innocent. But what happens if we're in between? What if you're, how, does, how, would, you, how would you assess the same sort of argument in a civil case, in which there's no presumption on either side, it's just the balance of, of probabilities? How would, you, how would you use statistical significance? To what extent does statistical significance relate to the kind of balance of probabilities that, that decides the case. Yeah, I think I think I think it's clearly different there. So in, in, in that case, statistical statistical significance certainly is, uh, is is a factor, and you would have to take it into account. Now, to my knowledge, uh, nobody has as of yet squared the circle and and come up with uh, with sort of thresholds as to which which should be the levels of uh, of significance that should be used in these in these tests and so on. Uh, that'd be an interesting, uh, an interesting question. I don't. It'd be interesting to if anybody's got experience on that. I don't. Uh, it is in but, uh, but but clearly, it's 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 to be taken in, into account in those cases. Well, there is uh, there is in America there is the reference manual for the courts, and there are three levels. That, so the standard is five percent, and then but there are circumstances in which you may be more stringent, and it's one, or more lenient. And it's 10, but I, I think it also very much depends on, because what Tilo was saying before, it very much depends on the data that you have and on what you are testing. Because, for example, if you are just testing two averages and you have very, very small samples, like two samples of 20 people, then you're much more likely to find that, you know, they are the same because you need a very big difference for it to be statistically significant. So it depends on the data that you have. If you have 10,000 people, you need a tiny, tiny little difference and it's statistically significant. But for the courts and for regression analysis, it is 
usually. Uh, that's according to what they do in America. Right, I think time's almost up. Maybe yeah. last question, if any of the panel members wants to make additional comments. Are you all done? Good. Right, in which case, um, thank you very much uh, for being here on behalf of us four panel members and uh, also on behalf of the previous panel members. Um, and we close the evening with drinks next door, please. Thank you. Thank you.